All right, well, first of all, it's a great pleasure being here um, and an honor. My name is Ronan Bletcher uh, from Israel, from Ellie Zelter's lab, and in addition from Asaf Arufay Medical Center. And um, I finished my residency around three years ago and decided to make a little detour um, by doing some basic research. And this is what I wanted to share with you uh, today. Now, as you all know, um, from the clinical practice, um, some fractures need no treatment at all. Um, humeral birth fractures is one good example. Um, and we don't know the reason for that. It's really an observation, but we do know that these fractures tend to realign um, in a very fast and very uh, satisfactory manner. Now, in attempt to study uh, this phenomenon, uh, fractures were performed in newborn mice. That was a, a a project that was a preliminary to my project. And the fractures were followed with in vivo micro CT scan. And what was noticed is that uh, the realignment occurred very impressively in, and in a very fast manner, and very repeatedly within a matter of days. As you can see, uh, angulation of around 45 degrees just went down to five degrees within a week. So that was quite amazing. and. Another important observation was that um, in order for that process to happen correctly, we need the uh, skeletal muscle, the adjacent muscle. Because uh, when the student injected uh, Botox to the triceps, this whole process was severely uh, interrupted. So these are just observations, and this is basic science. and. Quoting uh, Monty Python, this is completely different. Uh, this is something completely different. So, uh, well, intermediate conclusions were that, uh, first of all, bones have a natural morphological regeneration capabilities. And we termed the uh, phenomenon as natural reduction. And the realignment was proven to be through uh, pure movement and not through other processes known to us, such as remodeling or physis reorientation. And in addition, uh, muscle play a crucial role in this regulating, uh, in the regulation process of this realignment. So when I first joined the lab, I wanted to know whether this process is uh, age restricted. So I did another cruel thing, which was uh, to do fractures in mature mice this time. So um, I performed a kind of a surgical fracture to a mature three months old uh, mouse. And I noticed that, uh, surprisingly, the same process existed in mature animal. Because you can see, when I started the scanning from day 0 through day 35, um, again, the same robust realignment occurred. Again, th these were fractures that were uh, not immobilized with the standard techniques of uh, intramedullary, intramedullary nailing. But the animal was left uh, uh, to uh, mobilize as, as it wanted. So another important observation was that the most of the realignment process had occurred uh, in the early stages um, preceding any uh, observable ossification tissue in the micro CT, precluding or excluding uh, processes such as remodeling. So adding up uh, more numbers of animals and uh, representing the angulation with what we call the absolute, uh, absolute angle, which basically representation of the angulation in the two planes in, uh, in uh, one, uh, uh, one number, you see that uh, most of uh, animals have actually uh, succeeded to realign their fractures as early as a week or week and a half. So the key questions were, um, well, what is the underlying mechanism? How does a bone know it is deformed? Um, what is the sensor? What senses the deformity? And in addition, what corrects the deformity? Because there has to be some kind of a mechanism responsible for this uh, quite uh, astonishing observation. So we had to define to ourselves what are the requirements of such a corrective force. Well, first of all, it, it's got to have a, some kind of a sensing capability. It has to sense its biomechanical surrounding. It has to respond in a, in a fast manner and to 
well, ideally to uh, adapt local biomechanics because something has to realign the fractures, the fragments. So taking a closer look, um, I'm, I'm going back to histology. If you take a closer look at the muscle, you can see, you can spot every now and then these special organs which are termed muscle spindles. And if you will stain it for neural tissue uh, with markers such as the uh, neurofilament 200, you'll see that it is pos positively stained. Just a little reminder about muscle spindles. Um, These uh, mechanosensing organs can sense uh, stretching. They can propagate um, signal through the afferent fibers backwards into the spinal cord. Um, the signal can go up to the brain and provide what we call proprioception or the sixth sense. And in addition, of course, it provides uh, the stretch reflex. So basically, this system uh, fitted our uh, requirements because it can sense, it can react, and can adapt local biomechanics by influencing agonist and antagonist muscles in the same limb. So basically, our hypothesis was that if you have a fracture, uh, you probably have uh, some kind of a change in local muscle tension. The muscle spindles in the adjacent uh, muscle maybe can sense this change in the resting muscle tone and just maybe can cause a, a, a subsequent realignment. So we know more about uh, muscle spindles today than we knew uh, 20 years ago, and the reason is molecular biology. We know specific factors that are responsible for both development and maintenance of these organs. I'll, I'll just uh, um, talk about two. The one is RUNX3, which is a major transcriptional factor active in the uh, dorsal root ganglia. Um, and the other is EGR3 that acts from the muscle side. And uh, in case you lack any of those factors, you, you end up with a complete deficiency of muscle spindles. And you can see that the, the mice that are lacking these uh, factors, that are knockout for these factors, have a, a severe ataxia, which is pretty predictable. So um, our luck was that uh, RUNX3 deficient mouse was, very, was available in, in Wiseman because uh, just one floor beneath us, there was a lab that is working with these mice. So this served as a good entry point for our hypothesis because all I had to do was to take this poor mouse that is deficient with muscle spindles and cause a fracture. So this is the wild type animal, the sequence of the uh, realignment, the natural reduction that you already know about. And this is what happened when I uh, performed the fracture to a uh, RUNX3 deficient mouse. It failed to realign and fail to unite its fracture, which is also a, a very interesting phenotype. Again, by adding up, adding up a lot of uh, animals, you can see the clear difference and the uh, impairment in the fracture reduction uh, with uh, RUNX3 deficient mice. So that gave us a clue that muscle, spindle, uh, muscle spindles do have, uh, perhaps, a crucial role in fracture realignment um, but enough said about um, fractures. Now I would like to go into the next level, which uh, what I'm here for, and that's talking about other systems. Because we noticed that if you take a look at the fracture, you can think about a system that goes out of balance and tries to uh, get back into the balance that it used to be in terms of uh, muscle tensions around the fracture. Now, the same goes uh, with the spine, because the spine itself, if you think about it, is a very complex structure with dozens of joints, ligaments, tendons. It needs to, stra to stay straight. It needs to maintain its uh, curves. And if you think about a fracture that can go out of balance and fail to realign, you can think about, uh, of course, scoliosis, which is basically a spine that goes out of balance. So the big question was whether our mouse had scoliosis. So this is uh, a full body total CT scan, and our RUNX3 mice indeed had scoliosis. But uh, interesting as it is, uh, we know about dozens of mutants out there of mice with scoliosis. So the big question was, is it a congenital or an acquired deformity? 
So next we scanned uh, animals from day 40 to day 90. And as you can see, um, most of the mutant animals had no scoliosis at day 40, except for this uh, male, the first male who had scoliosis at day 40, and all the deformities had gotten worse by day 90. And the asterisk is here just to uh, remind us, me and you, that uh, mice re reach their sexual maturity between day 40 and day uh, 60. So we have a model for scoliosis, which is acquired and adolescent. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would uh, call it adolescent. But is, but is it idiopathic? So to answer this question, we have to compare uh, different anatomical uh, elements, such as bony and tendons and ligaments, maybe discs. So this time we did um, reconstruction and registration of uh, vertebrae of both control and mutants. And we noticed that um, morphology is, uh, is quite similar. The video is not working, but you would have to take my word for it. And when we compared different levels throughout the thoracic and lumbar spine, uh, you can see that both in uh, ages of 14 days and 25 days, when you put uh, vertebrae of control over a mutant mouse, morphology is maintained. This was another method that we used to uh, compare uh, soft tissue elements. We used a mouse in which uh, a major uh, component of uh, tendons and uh, discs called the scleraxis is uh, conjoined to a green fluorescent protein, the GFP, and that enables us to compare um, the intervertebral discs and some of the ligaments. And when we cross, uh, we did cross sections uh, in histology, you can see that the tissue that was most positively stained was these uh, outer layers of the annulus, and uh, this tissue had existed in both control and mutant mouse. So up until now, I, I hope I've convinced you that I have a very good model for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. But we have a different uh, problem, which is a genetic problem, and that concerns RUNX3, because RUNX3 is a major transcription factor, as I said. It expresses not only in neural tissue, but it also has a role in osteoblasts and, chondro and chondroblasts. So we need to determine which RUNX3 function is critical. So the ideal way would be to block its expression only in neural tissue and to show you that the phenotype remains the same. So uh, this is uh, when we used conditional knockout. Uh, just in briefly, it allows us for a tissue-specific ablation of RUNX3. And what we do is we use mice that express uh, Cree. Cree is an enzyme that can cut out uh, uh, a gene of interest that we want, such as RUNX3. So we need uh, mice that, that express, uh, that express uh, Cree under a specific promoter. We cross them onto a mouse uh, that in which RUNX3 gene is marked or flocked, and some of the offsprings will be uh, deleted with their RUNX3 gene only in neural tissue. So we generated two mice, two, uh, two uh, mutant strain, in which uh, RUNX3 was impaired only in neural tissue. The first was BRN3A, which is a marker for peripheral sensory tissue. As you can see, the, the staining uh, stains also the DRG and peripheral nerves. So that gave us limited deletion of RUNX3. And the other was WINT1 Cree. Uh, WINT1 is central in development of the, of the neural crest, and that gives us uh, a stronger deletion of RUNX3 throughout the nervous system. So we used uh, these two mutant strains to try and see if our phenotype uh, remains the same. So just about the phenotype, this is how seven-day-old uh, control mouse looks. And the RUNX3, you already see that he uh, walks on his belly with a spread of his forelimbs and hind limbs. He's severely ataxic. And so were our other neural mutants, mutants such as the BRN and the Wheat one Cree. We also did a gait cycle analysis to show that there is functional impairment in these mice. Um, 
But the big question was, of course, whether these mutants develop scoliosis. So that's the uh, wild-type mouse. The Runx3 I've already showed you that has scoliosis, and luckily we had scoliosis both in the BRN and the Wint1 mutants. So that's I think, is a, is a great result because what we did with these mutants is to delete specifically Runx3 in the neural tissue. And they gave us scoliosis. Now, the incidence of scoliosis was uh, also graded, as we thought, because when, when mutants had uh, a much larger percentage of uh, a phenotype compared with the BRN. Um, I'm, I also measured uh, the severity of scoliosis because I also wanted to, to measure the gradation and to see whether it exists throughout our uh, neural mutants. And um, this is just to show you that uh, I've measured the cub angle of the uh, major curve uh, through left and right sides and throughout the uh, thoracic spine. And I noticed that BRN mutants had some degree of scoliosis. Win one, because it's a much stronger deleter of RUNX3 function, had uh, much severe scoliosis. And this is the uh, RUNX3, as expected. So I went back to the literature. Are there any good models for scoliosis? Well, that depends on what you're looking at. Because if you're looking at congenital scoliosis, we have a multitude of syndromes and identified genes. But we have a different picture altogether in idiopathic scoliosis. Because these two are unrelated. In terms of available models, the models that exist are uh, involve injecting all kinds of bacteria and viruses and teratogens to, to poor animals, and performing tethering procedures, removing the pineal gland, whatever, you name it. And in terms of Canada genes, all we have is linkage analysis, which means taking families and comparing their genome and to see what affected subjects have in common. So I think that the significance of our work uh, was to establish a relationship between the model and the hypothesis regarding uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So um, in contrast to what is known about muscle spindles, most of the literature uh, deals with its uh, function in physiology and homeostasis. And we think that they may have a, a much bigger role in pathology this part may be much bigger than it is thought right now because it may be involved in deformity pathology. We have other um, areas that we think they are involved with. Future directions of our work uh, are to establish the organ level impact by non runx 3 pathways such as the EGR3 um, and deal with that mouse. And perhaps if, we left, if, if we'll have some time, maybe search for an altered muscle function using uh, RNA sequencing and the MR spectroscopy. So when I gave this lecture uh, at Wiseman, I, I said to a Wiseman student that I want him to think of the skeletal muscle not as a, a stupid a tissue, but as a smart tissue that can sense and regulate uh, its environment. So this is uh, my lab members uh, at the Wiseman. All have been very helpful, um, and thank you. Thank <laughs> you.